Hey, what motivates you? Is it being told you're good at something? Is it money maybe? Or a reward of some sort? Why don't we take a straw poll? Okay, we are recording now. At a little bit of, we might even start again. Okay. <laughs> At work, are you motivated to do a good job because A, you are paid to be there, B, you'll get a commission or a bonus, C, because it gives you a sense of personal achievement or because you feel guilty when you don't? Probably D the most, actually. Okay, so you're paid to be there but also you feel guilty when you don't. Dim? I guess to get paid, really? Ruby, what about you? Uh, probably a mix of A and D, All right. I think. Okay, yeah. so money and guilt. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> what about you, Rachel? Uh, also a mix of A and D because I like to do a good job of what I'm doing, but also I really don't want to be homeless. <laughs> <laughs> yep, totally fair enough. Question two. When you shop, are your purchases motivated by A, quality, B, sales... C, ethical choices. D, you see it, you want it, you buy it. What do you reckon, Z? Uh, 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 oh, none of, uh, <laughs> <what> the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> none of these. <laughs> My ethics go out the window. Oh, sales. Okay, so you want it, it's desire for it, but it's also got to be cheap. Uh, I don't want to phrase it like that because it makes me feel like a cheap one. <laughs> Probably B, sales, because yeah. I don't get paid enough, so <laughs> <laughs> got to watch out for that. <laughs> if it's on sale, I'll, I'll look at it twice, three times, and I'll most likely go for it. It's actually want, need, and then sales. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't need anything. I just want everything. Yes, fair enough. We A lot of us feel like that. I know, I know, every social scientist listening is screaming at me right now for doing a straw poll, but I promise the peer-reviewed stuff is coming. So what did this very anecdotal, decidedly unscientific party conversation tell us about incentives? The central thesis in economics is that incentives work whenever we want to correct behavior or shape behavior in a certain way, we can rely on incentives. And a large amount of research in microeconomics has gone into how to design the incentives in the optimal way. Nishvan Urkal is a professor of economics from the University of Melbourne. Now, when I talk about incentives here, I'm talking about extrinsic incentives, so given to people from external sources. And these can be financial or non-financial. For example, just by praising someone or with the promise of praising someone, you can also give them incentives. Those extrinsic incentives Nishvan mentions are probably familiar to many of us. Perhaps you've been motivated by a cash bonus or a commission in the workplace, or as a consumer, a big sale might be an extrinsic incentive to buy a frock or a swish pair of shoes that you didn't need. Then there are intrinsic incentives where the motivation comes from within. But don't assume that by internal motivation that I mean altruism. Some people will be motivated by social image and others will be just motivated because they like to do it and they themselves want to be the person doing something. And others will be purely motivated by how they respond to extrinsic financial incentives. Okay, so you're trying to motivate someone perhaps at work, perhaps at home. What will get the better outcome? Reinforcing the intrinsic incentives or straight up offering a more tangible reward? I'm afraid there is no clear answer there. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I guess the first step is to acknowledge this complexity in human behaviour and then try to develop ways to address that heterogeneity in different ways. So, you know, once you acknowledge it, then you can try to motivate behaviour through multiple channels. This is Seriously Social. I'm Ginger Gorman. And on the pod today, we'll find out how incentives motivate us or how they demotivate us, as the case may be.
When it comes to workplaces, Professor Neil Ashkenazi has this to say. People do need rewards. Rewards work. Neil is a professor of management in the business school at the University of Queensland and also a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. You offer somebody a monetary award, uh, which is quite attractive for achieving a goal, and they will redouble their efforts to achieve it. On the other hand, we need plenty of uh, strokes, plenty of of, of pats on our head. Uh, We're very much... Uh, motivated by wanting to feel uh, welcome, uh, wanting to feel that it's a positive environment that we work in. And surprisingly, we can take some quite severe knocks and still feel like that. In other words, people can face all sorts of challenges in their job, like working 14-hour days or caring for sick children or rescuing abused animals, and they won't mind turning up to work each day because they know that they are appreciated. On the flip side, material rewards won't work alone if everything else is pretty dire. Imagine you're in an organisation that's particularly difficult, uh, rather abusive, where you just hate coming to the office every day and you come in and and you do your work and then the boss throws a huge Christmas party and and, uh, gives everybody uh, awards and that sort of thing and thinks that that's going to make it up for all the misery that the employees have been experiencing throughout the year. But that doesn't work. We need uplifts to help us handle uh, the hassles that go on uh, day to day throughout our life. I've certainly been in the situation myself and I know many people I've interviewed in non-profits, for example, who are being paid actually quite poorly, but they believe in the work so much and they've got supportive colleagues and so they stay there beyond what I would consider reasonable and I've certainly done that as well myself. Hey, you're speaking to an academic. (laughs) (laughs) We work ridiculously long hours. I'm currently approaching retirement. I'm on a 50% um, appointment and I I, I like to tell my friends uh, that there's 168 hours in the week and I'm half time so I only have to work 84 hours a week. So uh, so my my wife doesn't appreciate that by the way but uh, academics are an example of one group that really works because we believe that we're making a difference and uh, I, I guess we get strokes when we get the, you know, the famous publication. (laughs) And what happens when we don't get those uplifts? If that psychological contract is broken, if you just feel that you become physically ill every time you come to work, etc., doesn't matter what sort of positive contract uh, you have, you're going to break it. And you see it constantly in the the news, especially with sports stars. Uh, You'll see that the relationship between a coach and a well-known player has uh, broken down and uh, the player insists on going to work uh, somewhere else and the public is saying, oh, why are they doing that? Um, Surely they know that they're getting this amazing uh, package at the moment. Uh, But no, the psychological uh, contract will uh, will trump. People simply do not um, um, feel safe or comfortable uh, working in a situation where they where they feel that their organisation is not supporting them. Are there other situations where incentives don't work and they are actually almost absorbed by the person in the opposite way? It might be that they're seen as a disincentive or a punishment even. In psychology, there's a particular phenomenon we refer to as um, as negative reinforcement. We all know what positive reinforcement is. I mean, you, you get um, animals to do amazing things by giving them positive reinforcement. But negative reinforcement is when you uh, reward somebody well, but then you threaten to take the reward away from them. That can then itself act as a, as a huge uh, dis- disincentive. Uh, so if you uh, reward somebody at a high level and then say, well, if you don't shape up, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to continue this level of remuneration, even though the low, lower level of remuneration might be very positive. Uh, the person feels that they're, uh, they're belittled, uh, it's going to feel they're, they're going to affect their esteem, etc. And uh, people will feel literally that they're being, they're being punished simply by still getting a good uh, salary package, for instance, but it's not what they really uh, were led to expect they should be getting. Something else that happens in workplaces is employees begin to compare incentives. Psychologists would call that equity theory. We actually do a cost-benefit analysis. How much has that person put in 
that, that got them the reward and how much have I put in uh, that's got me no reward. So people are making those sorts of comparisons all the time and it's a, a great recipe for, uh, for unhappiness. We tend to make comparisons with like others. So I won't compare myself, for instance, to a famous movie star and say the movie star gets paid um, $50 million. Why aren't I getting $50 million? But I will compare myself to the person who's in the office two or three uh, doors away and saying, oh, what's that person doing that they've gotten that reward? Uh, I can do better than them anyway. So we're making these social comparisons, but we do so in a sort of semi-rational basis in that we, we make the comparisons with people that we can compare to ourselves. I've chosen only in recent years to become a freelance writer and novelist, which is not a career path one takes if they're incentivised by money or that they fear rejection or they need a team of colleagues around them with bosses setting KPIs. So I work alone and I'm really my own motivator. Jo Pybus thinks that she might have unlocked the secret for incentivising herself. I was no slacker when it came to procrastination. I had countless runs on the board for putting off to tomorrow what I should do today. And I really wanted to get my body back in shape after having the kids. So I started this program that included running a couple of days a week. And I became quite proficient in setting the alarm only to turn it off and go back to sleep. So I was good at that. Now, this went on and on, and it was really exhausting waking to a a 6am alarm that reinforced my defeat before I even got started. So I got really angry with myself and I set myself an ultimatum that if I didn't get up that very next morning, I would simply stop trying to do that program. Now, I'd always had the resources and I'd always had my husband's support and I always had a fully functioning alarm clock, but now I had something else and that was a fear of what I might miss out on if I didn't give it a good hard go. So I really broke the seal on my procrastination and developed something that has really powered me since and that's Not a fear of failure that I'd be awful at running, but a fear of regretting not trying to run in the first place. And so this was the beginning of what I now call my regret intolerance, which is a term I heard on a podcast recently. And it served me well as I went on to represent Australia three times as an age group triathlon and cyclist. I've never heard that term before, though, regret intolerance. How do you define it inside your own mind? If I I look at it now in in respect to what I'm, you know, doing now, I mean, you know, five years ago I decided I wanted to become a writer and the first thing I did was dive headfirst into writing a novel, having no idea how to write a novel. But for me it was when I looked online and I saw um, suggestions that 97% of manuscripts never get finished that I realised that was it. That was the carrot that was dangling in front of me. Here's another endurance event and a finish line. I knew that I had very little chance of ever becoming successful at being a novelist in terms of publishing and turning into a movie and making millions of dollars. I mean, there's enough data out there that suggests writers are poor. But it was the idea that there was something that I could finish and I wanted to be one of the 3% of people that finished their book. I think that's great and more power to Jo for finding a way to motivate herself. But is it healthy to be driven by a fear of regret? It's certainly not a policy HR departments can develop to motivate their workers. The reality is humans aren't as rational as we'd like to think we are and all sorts of emotions work as intrinsic motivators. And something that can happen with extrinsic incentives is that people start to question them if they seem disproportionate to the action. Here's Professor Neil Ashkenazi again. People do make these sort of quasi-rational decisions. Equity theory is basically a a rational decision-making process about irrational things, if you (laughs) want to put it that way. We're constantly making these uh, these comp- comparisons, and uh, especially when people are, are giving us something a reward that seems um, out of whack. That's going to raise uh, suspicions every time. What's wrong with this that you have to give me such a big reward? It could be that intrinsic incentives are enough, and adding a material reward, particularly one that seems disproportionate, can make you question your intrinsic incentives. There are other problems too. Professor Nishvan Urkal 
says sometimes we will misinterpret incentives as a lack of trust. Because I may interpret it as saying, oh, they don't trust me to do the right thing and that's why I'm being provided incentives to do this. Or you may think that this must be a risky task or a difficult task and that's why they're providing me incentives to do it. So from the existence of incentives, you make inferences and those inferences may change how you perceive the situation and may change your motivations. One thing to keep in mind when you're giving incentives is the short run versus the long run effects. Um, Short run is when the incentive is in effect and the long run is after it's removed. So if we look at the behavior after the incentives is gone. Um, So how you your perception of the situation changes may have some impact in the short run or not, and it uh, may have an effect in the long run and may change your motivation both in the short run and the long run for that reason. Can you give me an example of what you mean? Yes. So, for example, there was a field study done in Israel with child care centers. It was a problem that parents were picking up their kids late and they decided to impose a small fee for being late. So what they've observed is that in the short run, the fees actually cause the parents to come and pick up their kids even later. And, you know, one interpretation you can give for this is that it's changed how they perceive the situation. So before, you know, maybe I was trying to do the right thing as a parent because I was worried about getting bad looks or I was worried about my kid feeling bad. Um, You know, while others are picking up their kids, he's not being picked up. Once there is a fee that I can pay, it changes how I perceive it. And now I can pay a small fee and I just get longer care. And in that way, we say it's crowding out your internal motivation not to be late. So your other uh, reasons for not being late. So just let me get this clear in my head. Basically, before I had to pay a fee for picking up my kid late, I was worried about the social implications. I was worried that my kid's going to look bad, I'm going to look bad. But once I can pay money, I think it's a service, I'm paying for this, I can come late to get my kid. I'm just going to spend some extra time at work and finish this task and I'll just pay the money. Exactly, yeah. You have your internal reasons for not being late and then um, this fee introduction basically says now I can buy more care and maybe it's not that big a deal that I'm late because it's a small fee that I'm paying. So it basically in some sense maybe trivializes the um, situation. And then you said in the long run there was also an impact. So what was that longer term impact on the late fees and the parents? So what they observed is that when you remove the fees. And if you compare the parents who were subject to the fees versus the parents who weren't, so the control group, what they observed is that the parents who were subjected to the fees continued to come later (laughs) than they were coming before the introduction of the fees. Okay, people's behaviour is tricky, which makes figuring out how to motivate them challenging. And it's about to get even trickier. Sometimes an incentive can redirect a person's motivation into the wrong places. That's one reason economists do a lot of research to find the right incentives, because we don't want people focusing too much on the juicy reward that lies ahead at the expense of achieving the desired outcome. If you pay teachers, depending on the performance of their students, then they're just going to prepare the students for the exams. So you're shifting their attention from the overall learning experience and, you know, emphasizing different aspects of learning to just focusing on what you're giving incentives on, which is, you know, performance in the exams. It's also possible for extrinsic incentives to become intrinsic if a person begins to feel the personal benefits of their actions. Say you start to follow a more healthy lifestyle through incentives given to you, or you start to do better in high school because you were given some extrinsic incentives for getting good grades, then once you learn the benefits of having a healthy lifestyle, or once you learn that 
uh, being successful actually makes you feel really good, then your internal motivation for following a healthy lifestyle or working in school may grow. And in that way, the initial provision of explicit incentives may actually change how you perceive things in a good way and may uh, increase your internal motivation in the long run. So I can't help but circle back to my earlier question. When should you offer rewards and when should you just let people do something because they want to? In areas where people are more motivated by financial rewards, incentives are going to work better. And there is uh, plenty of evidence that tells us the incentives we give in the workplaces for rewarding performance, they work well, but with a lot of caveats. Here's Professor Neil Ashkenazi again. The current literature tells us that uh, that wise incentives are tailored to the individual. When you try to motivate people, you need to understand what actually motivates them. Uh, are they going to be um, motivated by the holy dollar or are they going to be uh, motivated by uh, feelings of respect? People vary in the extent to which those particular effects uh, are, are motivating and, and, and a good HR department will work out person by person on a, an individual basis what's going to be the best approach to, uh, to motivate an individual, obviously within the constraints that the organisation itself has. But um, any policy that's applied without considering that humanistic side is going to run you into trouble. Okay, last question. You exercise because it makes you feel good. It makes you look good. You feel guilty if you don't. Or you're a Hollywood actor and you're paid $60 million per movie to look like a Marvel hero. Well, I don't work out at all. <laughs> I'd like to think it makes me look good and I hope in the end it does, but generally it makes me feel good. I actually don't exercise, so I can't answer any of those questions. Probably A, B and C and I wish it was D. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Seriously Social. I'm Ginger Gorman. If you're enjoying the podcast, one of the best ways to support us is to subscribe. And if you listen through Apple Podcasts, drop a review in there for us as well. We love reading them and it does help other people find us as well. Seriously Social is produced by Kim Lester, engineered by Mark Gargledonk, aka Baldy, and executive produced by Sue White and Bonnie Johnson. It's an initiative of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia. Next time, young people and debt, are they to blame for their own financial woes or should boomers, Gen Xers and even the geriatric millennials shoulder some of the responsibility? See you next time. <laughs>